Uh, all right, so hi everyone. So uh, thanks for coming today. So today our speaker is Roman Mayu, who's a uh, fourth year uh, PhD student uh, in computer science at Columbia University. And he's uh, working with Augustin Chantreau, who's also right here today. And so um, Roland has been like working and interested in um, algorithmic fairness and CS ethics. And so today he's going to um, tell us about some of his work in fairness. And so he is going to tell us about his paper on secrets, adversaries, incentives, and composition in algorithmic fairness. And so, yeah, um, go for it, Roland, take it away. Sorry about that. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Juba, um, and thank you for having me. Uh, can you see uh, the title slide of my presentation? Uh, yeah, it's working fine. OK, fantastic. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, I hope your summers are going uh, wonderfully so far. And thank you uh, for taking time out of your day uh, when you could potentially be outside enjoying the beautiful weather uh, to join this virtual seminar. Uh, my name is Roland Mayo. I'm a PhD student in computer science at Columbia University. I'm advised by Augustine Chantreau. And today I'll be presenting joint work with Augustine on secrets, adversaries, incentives, and composition in algorithmic fairness. Um, so I'm happy for this seminar to be highly interactive, especially since I hope that it's fun and thought provoking. So please feel free to unmute yourselves at any point and jump in with a question, comment, thought, uh, et cetera. Okay. So very briefly, uh, here's a three section outline of this presentation. Uh, first, we'll talk about the data brokers problem and its current solution in the literature, fair representations. Then we'll dive in, uh, deep into a study of fair representations in maliciousness and the cost of demographic secrecy, where we'll see that there may be opportunity for approaching the data brokers problem in a different way than is currently formulated in fair representations. And we'll study this opportunity in the final section, rationality and incentive compatible representations. So in this section of the presentation, I'll motivate our work uh, and sketch the landscape of algorithmic fairness that forms the starting point of our inquiry. So starting from the top, the field of algorithmic fairness is concerned with unfair or undesirably biased algorithms. By now, the fact that algorithms can be unfair is well known and documented with many real world examples across many important social domains. Uh, one such social domain is online advertising. Uh, here's just a small selection of ProPublica articles uh, that show that real world concerns have been raised about age, gender, and racial discrimination in the delivery of targeted advertisements for housing and job opportunities. Uh, but importantly, algorithmic fairness does not aim merely to document instances of unfair algorithms, but also to develop fairness interventions uh, to technically address unfairness. Uh, for online advertising, we might aim to prevent discriminatory harms like the ones on the previous slide by developing interventions that would ensure that uh, the fair and non-discriminatory delivery of online advertisements. Of course, the online advertising economy is complex. Uh, this is illustrated uh, uh, by the Lumascape graphic on the left, uh, which shows a, a bunch of the different companies that uh, participate in the uh, online advertising economy, um, as well as uh, what some of their roles are and kind of what their relationships are to one another. Uh, so I highlight here uh, two aspects, uh, which, uh, and all of this complexity of course, complicates the challenge of developing fairness interventions. Uh, so I highlight here two aspects that are especially relevant for this presentation. Uh, first, because there are many agents that interact in complex ways, and these agents apply different algorithmic tools, a fairness intervention must select and focus on a particular subsetting within online advertising. So for example, this could be the advertisement slot allocation stage which is often implemented as an option by an online advertising platform uh, or a prediction step uh, in which various prediction tasks are performed towards optimizing final advertising delivery, such as predicting whether a person will click on an advertisement. And the second aspect uh, that I'll highlight here is that the issue of fair composition uh, becomes especially important and difficult because there are many different agents uh, with different goals and that are acting independently of one another. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I will focus on a fairness intervention that targets one node of the data supply chain 
of the online advertising economy. And that is the interaction between a single data broker that controls a data set V and sells some data products, R of V, based on that data set to some number of customers, say N. Uh, if the data broker is concerned with the fairness of the computing systems that its customers build using the data product, then the data broker faces the following problem. What, if anything, can it do to ensure the fairness of its customers' computing systems? So um, we call this the data broker's problem. Uh, and it was first formulated in Zemel et al's seminal 2013 paper. Uh, that introduced the solution concept of a fair representation. Um, we'll return to fair representations and the data brokers problem uh, throughout this presentation, uh, but for the moment, let's zoom back out to the level of fairness interventions. Uh, so when developing, choosing, and applying fairness interventions, uh, in general, uh, there are many issues that must be considered, uh, but in this presentation, we'll focus on three of them. So the, the first issue is uh, the cost of fairness. So a common setup in algorithmic fairness is to begin with an optimization problem right, where the goal is, of course, to find a feasible solution that maximizes the objective value of some objective function. Uh, it, is, uh, it is natural to assume that the data brokers uh, designs the data product R of V to be as valuable as possible overall to its end customers. Uh, so representing the utility R of V to the ith customer by you survive R of V, right? The natural choice of objective function for the data broker is then the sum of the customer's utilities. Uh, and the data broker's optimization problem is then to maximize the objective by finding a feasible solution R from a set of possible feasible solutions. Uh, given the optimization problem, right, then a suitable and application dependent formalization of fairness is chosen and imposed as a fairness constraint. Uh, in theory, the constraint limits the set of feasible solutions, uh, and therefore the optimal objective value of the fairness constraint is bounded above by the optimal value without fairness constraints. Uh, and the cost of fairness is uh, the difference between the unconstrained optimal objective value uh, and the constrained optimal objective value. So in, in other words, it is the theoretically minimum amount of utility that is necessarily lost by requiring the chosen notion of fairness. Uh, so recall that the data broker is concerned with the fairness of the computing systems built by its customers and is seeking to maximize the sum of the customer's utilities uh, subject to fairness. Each customer I uses the data product uh, to solve its own optimization problem. Uh, let's represent by L sub I. Um, and each uh, of their customers' specific optimization problems is associated with its own cost of fairness, um, say kappa of L sub i. And the cost of fairness uh, for the data broker's optimization problem uh, is then the, the sum of the co customer's costs of fairness. So uh, an important consequence of the cost of fairness is that it defines a critical design goal for any practical fairness intervention. Uh, the intervention should aim to achieve the theoretical cost of fairness. Uh, naturally, in, in practice, it is expected that uh, it will be difficult to exactly achieve the cost of fairness uh, or due to such realities as, say, poor data quality uh, or a mismatch between the idealized objective and the proxy objectives that uh, they are being worked with, uh, and of course, you know, uncertainty. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a, it, at least in theory, it's a, a goal to try and provide uh, guarantees that the chosen intervention will not impose further costs than the cost of fairness uh, itself. Okay, so that, that was the first uh, issue uh, that fairness intervention was stressed with. Uh, the second is uh, the issue of modeling agent behavior. So the data broker's problem illustrates the importance of this issue because how the data broker models its customer's behavior uh, determines the optimal solutions to the data broker. Uh, and uh, to show this, uh, we'll first put some more structure on the data broker's problem as we have developed it so far. Uh, we need to do two things. Uh, first, we need to specify a little bit further the customer's optimization problems. And second, uh, we'll need to uh, 
choose a notion of fairness that the data broker which it wishes to guarantee. So uh, an extremely common uh, machine learning task is binary classification in a supervised learning setting. Uh, and in the data supply chain of online advertising, the data broker's customers might be advertisers uh, and each advertiser I uh, might want to predict which individual in the data set V will click on its advertisements. Uh, so V is a data set of individuals uh, where each individual uh, in V is labeled X of I of V uh, by some function um, uh, that is labeled uh, the labeling function of uh, advertiser I's binary classification problem. Uh, so note that uh, we're setting things up a little bit differently than the standard binary classification problem. Um, and we're doing this uh, ultimately so that we can try and study uh, fair representations independent of the particular uh, representation and, and methods that are chosen. Um, so we're using V not to denote say the feature vector of an individual, but rather their identity uh, in the, the data set. So um, given this then customer eyes optimization problem, uh, L sub i is to find the classifier D sub i uh, based on the data product uh, that correctly predicts the class of as many individuals in V uh, as possible. Okay, so next we need to specify the data broker's notion of fairness. Uh, there are many notions uh, of fairness in the literature. We will focus on one of the most prominent and extensively studied. Uh, it's also the one that was studied in uh, Zemel et al's uh, paper on fair representations, demographic parity. We will assume that there are a set of groups G uh, and each individual in the data set uh, V belongs exclusively to one group and can, can be mapped to that group by some group membership function gamma. Uh, and with this setup, the, the data brokers uh, demographic parity requires that uh, the individuals uh, in any pair of groups receive outcomes, uh, any particular outcome uh, with the same probability uh, as each other, right? at the same rate. Okay, so now that we have defined the customer's optimization problems and the data broker's chosen notion of fairness, we can show the importance uh, of modeling agent behavior to the data broker's problem. Uh, so in the literature on algorithmic fairness so far, two models of behavior have primarily been studied. The first and by far the most common is the beneficent model. Uh, and the second is the malicious model. So the vast majority of fairness interventions developed to date are in the beneficent model. Um, and in this model, an agent is assumed to be self-sacrificing and can be counted on to unilaterally and volitionally apply a fairness intervention uh, to be fair and thereby incur a cost to its own utility, uh, that is at least the cost of fairness, uh, and that in principle, it, it has the ability to avoid if it were not to uh, apply a fairness intervention. So if an agent is beneficent, uh, then like towards this goal of uh, limiting the loss of utility, it, it doesn't make sense for a fairness intervention to add any further controls, uh, and in particular, any information controls, uh, because of course, doing so can only conflict uh, with, the, with that goal. Uh, accordingly, fairness interventions in the beneficent model typically assume that agents have full and unfettered access to the available data. So if our data broker models its customers as beneficent, then a simple and optimal solution to its problem is to sell the data set directly to its customers. Um, and then, you know, of course, rely on the customers to uh, incur the cost of fairness to themselves. Now, when Zemel et al. formulated the data brokers problem, uh, they recognized that in some sense, uh, there isn't really a problem unless the data brokers customers are not beneficent. Uh, and they therefore formulated the malicious model. Uh, and so in the malicious model, the agent's only objective is to be as unfair as possible. Uh, fairness interventions in the malicious model assume that a trusted third party is able to apply a fairness intervention to the data that forces the malicious agent 
to be fair, no matter what it does with the data. And uh, Zemel et al's key observation was that uh, if the data broker models its customers as malicious, then it cannot release the original data set. But there is something else that the data broker uh, can do. And what they observed was that uh, if the data product the customer receives is demographically uninformative, then whatever the customers do with the data, uh, it must satisfy demographic parity. And so therefore the, the data broker can guarantee demographic parity by first applying a transformation to the original data set to remove the demographic information and then releasing the transformed data set to its customers. Uh, of course, the data broker also aims for the transformation to otherwise preserve the informativeness of the transformed data as much as is possible. So uh, formally, uh, Zemel et al. proposed a data broker's fair representation problem. Um, and uh, their, uh, their work was concerned with um, actually giving a practical method that could actually be applied to data. Um, so they formulated the problem with uh, a feature vector space um, X uh, and a fair representation space Z, some data set uh, V and X to the M, uh, a representation utility function U, uh, and then the problem is to find the transformation R, which maps uh, feature vectors in X uh, to fair representations in Z that maximizes U and satisfies demographic uh, uh, secrecy. Uh, that is, for every uh, point Z in the fair representation space, and for every group G, uh, the probability that an individual who is uh, exhibiting the fair representation vector Z belongs to the group G should be the same as the probability uh, of that and a randomly selected individual um, uh, it, it belongs to that group uh, as well. Okay, uh, so. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, in, in addition to protecting the groups in the data and providing a solution to the data broker's problem, uh, the demographically secret fair representations have a very nice property for composition, uh, which is the third and final issue uh, we will introduce here uh, that uh, fairness interventions uh, must grapple with. Uh, so not only do uh, demographically secret fair representations guarantee the demographic parity of the first computing system that a customer of the data brokers might build using the data. Uh, they also guarantee that if the second computing system is applied only to the output of the first, then that second computing system will also satisfy demographic parity. Uh, and in fact, uh, any number of sequentially composed um, computing systems, as long as they only use uh, first that original data set and the output of the sequential systems, that they will all satisfy um, demographic parity. Uh, and this is a, a particularly nice property uh, because a large body of work in algorithmic fairness studying the issue of fair composition has shown that in general, uh, it's very challenging um, to ensure uh, uh, fair composition. Okay, so uh, we've seen that if the data brokers customers are malicious, then ensuring demographic parity requires that the data broker impose uh, demographic secrecy on the data. Um, we've laid out the known desirable properties of demographic secrecy. However, uh, it is a strikingly severe constraint. Uh, it is a, a, a constraint that binds over every single point in the fair representation space. Uh, and so it's natural to wonder whether it has any undesirable consequences. And if so, uh, what might those be? Uh, and to the best of our knowledge, uh, no prior work has theoretically um, studied um, this question. Okay, so uh, again, towards answering uh, these questions, uh, we first need to formulate a method independent model of rep fair representations that encapsulates the many methods that have been developed um, for learning a fair representation. And so the, the methods differ in many ways. Um, so for example, they allow variation in the structure of the feature vector space of the original data set and the fair representation space of the transformed data set. Uh, they have different objective functions for preserving the non-demographic information 
uh, and they allow many different kinds of uh, transformation algorithms to be chosen. But fundamentally, they all take a collection of what are initially uh, distinguishable individuals by their different feature vectors in the original uh, representation space. Um, and then they mix and match um, these uh, initially distinguishable individuals um, together in some way to obscure demographic information and uh, achieve the demographic secrecy uh, condition. So we'll model this by focusing um, on the uh, set of individuals uh, whose data is transformed independent of the structure of their representation in the either in the original data set uh, or in the transformed data set. Um, and uh, we'll model the uh, transformation or the, the fair representation as partitions of those sets of individuals where each part in the partition corresponds to uh, a group of individuals that are put together that are subsequently um, indistinguishable to any uh, agent or, or any customer using the transform data. Okay, so um, with a method independent model of fair representations, uh, we, uh, we can first, uh, uh, we can now start to answer our questions. So our first result is that uh, when the data broker has a single customer, uh, there is no cost of demographic secrecy. Um, that, so demographic secrecy does not impose a further utility cost beyond uh, the cost of fairness. Um, this is because it is always possible, uh, at least in theory, for the data broker to find a demographically secret fair representation that achieves the cost of fairness. Uh, and the data broker can do this uh, essentially by uh, solving its customer's optimization problem uh, that, that single customer and uh, encoding that optimally fair solution in the representation itself and then releasing that uh, to the customer. So this works out in the following way. So suppose that uh, the customer's optimization problem is to perform binary classification and let D star be an optimal fair classifier. So it satisfies demographic parity and it achieves the cost of fairness. Uh, notice that D star partitions the set of individuals uh, and that this partition is demographically secret because um, D star is fair and satisfies demographic parity. Uh, so the data broker then chooses the transformation R equal D star or the, the, the representation uh, uh, that, that's induced by D star. Um, and, uh, and so R then achieves the cost of fairness uh, because D star is an optimal uh, fair classifier. So this is pretty neat so far uh, because what is ostensibly an extremely severe constraint um, uh, uh, affords a, a nice fairness guarantee, or affords those nice fairness guarantees at no theoretical cost uh, in this case. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this does not hold in general. So in the case of one customer, right, we, we saw that demographic secrecy comes at no utility cost uh, because the data broker basically acts as a trusted proxy for the customer and solves its optimization problem. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this strategy of uh, trying to solve simultaneously all of the customer's optimization problems irrecoverably fails uh, when there are more than one customer. Um, so consider the, the following toy example. Uh, the data set B is a set of just four individuals. We have W, X, Y, and Z. Uh, so one individual per row. Um, the individuals belong to two groups. Uh, so W and X, the first two rows are members of group zero uh, as indicated by the third column. And Y and Z are members of group one. Uh, there are two customers that are represented by the labeling functions F1 and F2. Um, it's given in the first and second columns. Um, so with this, uh, first notice that the labeling functions themselves satisfy demographic uh, parity. Uh, so an optimal classifier that correctly classified every individual would be incidentally fair um, for either labeling function. But uh, the data broker doesn't choose a demographically secret 
uh, representation because the underlying labeling functions are unfair. It does so because it seeks to protect against malicious customers. Uh, so let's consider the data broker's choices. So in this case, um, there are only two non-trivial demographically se secret fair representations, uh, Z1 and Z2. Um, and both uh, of these uh, fair representations uh, make pairs of all of the individuals. And notice that in, in every possible pair of individuals, uh, they differ on the labels assigned by uh, one of the two labeling functions. So this implies that any classifier for the, the labeling function on which the individuals differ um, must make at least one mistake. Um, so to, to illustrate that, consider the pair of individuals um, W and Y uh, made by the fair representation Z1. Um, in this case, customer two cannot distinguish individuals W and Y uh, and any classifier D2 uh, that customer two would choose uh, must assign W and Y the same classification. But since W and Y differ on their labels assigned by F2, uh, D2 must make a mistake on either W or Y. So overall, what we see here is the tension between hiding demographic information as required by demographic secrecy on the one hand and preserving demographic or not, excuse me, preserving non-demographic information on the other, on the, on the other hand. And we see that here this, or, and we see that this tension is not always reconcilable. Um, and although this uh, tension has been uh, uh, recognized since the beginning of research on fair representations, its utility implications beyond the cost of fairness have not. Uh, so one interesting feature of our toy example is that it also has implications for the fair composition of demographically secret fair representations. Uh, it implies that aggregating different demographically secret fair representations of the same individuals potentially breaks the demographic secrecy property. Uh, so to, to see this, note that um, it is possible to recover the identities and therefore the groups of the individuals given both rep representations Z1 and Z2 uh, as if you can link uh, the representations to the same uh, individual. Okay. So uh, our toy example shows that in general, there is a cost of demographic secrecy. Uh, however, it is uh, specific to exactly two particular labeling functions over a set of four individuals. Um, but notice three things about our toy example. Uh, first, the labeling functions were inherently fair. Uh, second, that every pair of individuals was exactly having distance one away from each other uh, by interpreting their, the collective labels as a binary string. And third, that there were exactly two groups of equal size. Uh, uh, that is, we, we say that the set V was uh, bi a binary balance set. Uh, so uh, given a binary balance set of any size, uh, we can, it turns out, uh, by carefully constructing a binary error correcting code, uh, and using those codes to construct a collection of customers labeling functions, we can show that the cost of demographic secrecy can scale quadratically in the size of uh, the set of individuals. This shows that the cost of demographic secrecy is not merely a quirk that can occur when there are only four individuals, but that it is a concern for any number of individuals. That being said, still, this theorem relies on constructing inherently fair labeling functions for the customers. Um, and it doesn't really give much insight into, say, the, the prevalence of the cost of demographic secrecy uh, or its typical severity. Okay. Uh, so, to try and get a sense of those particular issues, uh, we're, we'll take the following approach. Uh, we'll consider a stylized but natural model for randomly sampling and labeling functions for the data broker's customers. And we'll analyze the expected cost of fairness and the expected cost of demographic secrecy in this model. So this model is uh, the, the, the random functions model 
Um, and it just, it takes as input, a set of the individuals V, a number of customers N, and a probability parameter P, and samples N independent, identically distributed labeling functions F sub I, um, by setting the value uh, F sub I of U equal to one with probability P and zero otherwise for every individual U in the, the set V. So uh, a key thing to note about the random functions model in contrast to the previous examples is that although the expected labeling fun uh, uh, or although the labeling functions are inherent fair in expectation uh, because the labels are assigned independent of any group membership, uh, the probability that a sampled labeling function is inherently fair is typically very low. That is, we expect uh, uh, it, it is more likely that a randomly sampled labeling function will be unfair. Okay. Uh, so uh, for analyzing the expected cost of fairness uh, in this model, uh, it turns out that uh, as long as we have you know, two groups of equal size and we have a uh, number of customers that is logarithmic in the size uh, or in the number of individuals um, and the probability parameter P satisfies these inequalities, uh, that the expected cost of fairness is um, they, uh, or scales linearly in the uh, number of customers uh, and it scales uh, as the square root of uh, the, the number of um, individuals. Um, okay. And for comparison, uh, yes. Sorry, can I just um, ask a quick question? Can you, um, I'm guessing like, so I'm guessing like, you know, if you have data set that's like large enough, then like there is not really that much restriction on P, but what's kind of like the meaning like interpretation of like having N of the order of like log D here? Yeah, uh, great question. So it, it actually turns out that if, uh, well, let's go back to the scaling uh, result, right? Uh, for this theorem, uh, I didn't cover it in the slides, but um, uh, here, right, the n is theta size v, so you get the quadratic scaling. And uh, in restricting n to be logarithmic in the number of individuals, the goal was to try and see if um, we would still get uh, the cost of demographic secrecy growing meaningfully for a smaller number of customers, right? Because um, here, right, like uh, kind of trying to map, mapping this back to our motivational setting of online advertising, this would say that, you know, if if the set of individuals is all the people in the, in the United States, like 330 million, you expect something on the order of that for the number of um, advertisers, which is you know, like uh, uh, not, uh, like in, in practical terms, that's not very realistic. There's clearly very fewer than a linear number of advertisers in the number of people um, in a uh, total addressable market. Um, so we we scaled down n to the to be logarithmic in the in the size of v to see if um, it, like if by taking a smaller number um, the cost of demographic secrecy might disappear or not. Um, was that uh, clear? Uh, yeah, made, uh, made a lot of sense. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you. And please, uh, if anyone else has any questions at any point, please um, jump in by all means. I've got a quick question that's probably related to something you already told us, but I zoned out for. Uh, can, can you go back to the <clears throat> slide where you have the root V scaling? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so just re remind me of the scale of the quantities and the cost of fairness. Like, like it, it, is the utility function that we're sort of thinking about on the scale of V or? or... Right, so um, for, for getting fairness for a second, just the unconstrained optimization problem, yes, the utility is on the scale of V, right? Or it, it would, for each customer, the maximum utility would be correctly predicting the label of every individual in the data set. There's v, size V of them. So it's size V 
um, times n to the n uh, okay. customers. So if I like normalize this to be like, you know, average error as I typically think of like, you know, the machine learning objective so that it's between zero and one, this would be saying that the cost of fairness is like going to zero at a rate of one over root V. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other questions at the moment? Okay. Uh, here we. Okay. Yes. And this is where we were um, uh, picking back up from. Right. So, uh, in expectation, um, under the random functions model, uh, we expect the cost of fairness itself to scale uh, linearly in n uh, and uh, as the square root of the number of individuals. And so, but we want to compare this to the cost of demographic secrecy. Um, and in our next result, um, we found that the cost of demographic secrecy um, scales um, at least uh, uh, exponentially in the number of um, customers, uh, but still as the square root of size V. And this is, um, with the same precondition as the previous theorem. So the same um, regime of the number of uh, advertisers to, or the you number know, of customers to the size of the uh, set of individuals and the same constraints on the parameter P. Okay. Uh, so to, to summarize this section, uh, we have shown that when the data broker sells to more than one customer, in, in general, demographic secrecy does not come for free. That is, it may impose further utility costs that are separate from and in addition to the cost of fairness. Uh, further, we have shown that this cost of demographic secrecy can scale in the size of the set V. And finally, we showed in a stylized yet natural model that the cost of demographic secrecy um, can scale exponentially in the number of customers. So altogether, uh, these results demonstrate that demographic secrecy is a potentially costly uh, fairness intervention, uh, and, it and they clarify the limits of uh, demographic secrecy as a tool for fair composition. Sorry, can I just ask one more question about of course. The, the normalization? So if I'm understanding this correctly, like, you know, if I think about this as um, you know, normalized quantities where the object, you know, where the error rate is between zero and one, your sort of first theorem is saying, look, um, the cost of fairness goes to zero at a rate of like, you know, log V over root V, plugging in your, you know, upper bound of N is log V. Um, but your second thing is sort of saying something qualitatively different. It's saying the cost of fairness might not go to zero at all, because if I plug in N is log V, you know, two to the N is like, I guess it's two to the n over two, so it's like square root of v. Oh yeah, no, but it's still it's square root of v times square root of v. Um, so, so you get a quantity that doesn't go to zero when I look at the normalized quantities. So it's not just like a a difference in rate as you're presenting it here, but it's like a qualitative distinction. Like when I look at the normalized quantities, the first thing goes to zero when my when my population gets large, but the second thing doesn't. Am I thinking about this correctly? Yes. Yes, and uh, the second quantity, right? It's not as um, uh, it's not as tight. Like we uh, weren't able to get uh, an upper bound on, on what it would be, or besides like the, the trivial one of like everything, of course. Um, but so 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 uh, so yes. Okay. Uh, so actually, any other questions about that section before we move on? Okay, fantastic. So in the previous section, uh, we studied the utility implications of the data broker choosing demographic secrecy as a solution to the data broker's problem. Um, although we showed that these implications can be severe, uh, when the data broker is faced with malicious customers, um, it's really the only choice that it has to guarantee that those customers build computing systems that satisfy demographic parity. Um, in this section, uh, we turn to a third model of agent behavior, rationality, and we'll explore a new option that rationality affords to the data broker. 
So, right. so on the one extreme are uh, beneficent agents uh, who will be fair no matter the cost. And on the other extreme are malicious agents who will be unfair no matter the cost. And in between the two, we might imagine an agent who doesn't care about fairness per se, and simply acts to minimize its own cost and maximize its own utility. Such an agent is perfectly happy to be fair if that maximizes its utility and perfectly happy to be unfair otherwise. Uh, we call such an agent rational. Uh, of course, rational agents have been extensively studied and applied in many fields, including economics, game theory, mechanism design, and computer science in general. Uh, but to the best of our knowledge, uh, rational agents have received very little attention in the literature on algorithmic fairness, uh, especially in comparison to the beneficent and malicious models. Okay, so uh, if the data broker's customers are rational, then at least in theory, the data broker could ensure the demographic parity of its customers uh, by aligning demographic parity with their utilities. Uh, it could do this by selling to its customers a representation with the property that every customer maximizes their utility by being fair. Uh, we call such a representation uh, incentive compatible. And of course, a, a natural first question is, do incentive compatible representations uh, even exist? And going back to our toy example uh, from the previous section, we see that the data set itself is uh, an incentive compatible representation um, because the labeling functions F1 and, and F2 are inherently fair. Um, so a rational agent that could learn a perfect classifier would in doing so be incidentally fair. Uh, and this also has the nice uh, uh, other consequence that uh, any unfair classifier uh, necessarily does not achieve the maximum utility um, possible, right? So our toy example is a uh, incentive compatible representation, um, but also uh, going back to the binary error correcting codes um, that I mentioned in, in, in theorem one, um, although I didn't show the construction, uh, but it, it turns out that the labeling functions they construct are also inherently fair. Um, and so again, just releasing the data sets uh, it, for that would uh, uh, give an incentive compatible representation. Okay, so uh, we can conclude that incentive compatible representations exist, uh, but the examples I've given are exceptional, right, in, the, in that the labeling functions are inherently fair. Um, and, but of course, in the real world, uh, however, labeling functions often seem to be unfair. Uh, and so it's natural to ask uh, whether incentive compatible representations exist for unfair labeling functions. And if so, to what extent uh, might they be able to recover the cost of demographic secrecy? Uh, so we'll turn again to the random functions model to give an answer to this question. Um, and uh, surprisingly, I'm it's a, a lot of text up there, I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, surprisingly, it turns out that in, in a certain regime of the parameters, uh, an incentive compatible representation will exist that uh, recovers the entire cost of demographic secrecy with constant probability. Uh, the intuition behind this result is uh, the following. Uh, so instead of linking individuals together to hide the demographic information, the data broker only links those individuals together uh, th th uh, that are necessary to force the minimum number of mistakes um, to achieve fairness and uh, to avoid um, creating any further uh, mist mistakes. Uh, in general, uh, it may not be possible to achieve uh, this uh, minimal number of links, um, but uh, at least uh, for this parameter regime in the random functions model, uh, it, it happens to be possible with constant uh, probability. All right, I, I've got a dumb question that probably the answer is, again, that I like zoned out to the appropriate part of the model. But um, if I know what the target functions are for each of the downstream customers, how come I cannot come up with a incentive compatible representation by just for each of my customers solving the fair classification problem for them optimally and then encoding the solution in one of the coordinates of the representation and then uh, it, 
it seems like right. they'd be incentivized to just follow the classification of that uh, coordinate. Right. No, I'm, absolutely. Like that is um, you. You could do that, right? Where you just sell to each of the customers separately. Well, well, even uh, even I could come up with one representation that just has a separate coordinate for each uh, customer if I if I cared about having a single representation. Oops. So I yes, but then you would uh, so it was set to compatible. No, because uh, or I, I I think. I think the issue with that approach would be that if um, so, let's say customer one, you you have some number of indices that encode its optimal decisions, um, but you don't restrict it. But you then have further indices that you set corresponding to the other customers' optimization problems. In that case, you're relying on uh, customer one to ignore that extra information and to still go with what the coordinates you've given it are. But the issue with that would be um, the, the customer one could still, could, could potentially, it, it, it might turn out that this isn't an issue, but I think in general, it could potentially use the information from the other customers to tell, uh, to, 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 to do a little bit better than- I see. The two, you know, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense, thanks. Great. No, no, great question. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I confirm that. that's exactly the reason. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Augustine. Uh, okay. And so uh, this, of course, leaves uh, a lot of demographic information in the representation uh, that is like for incentive compatible representations, um, which a malicious agent um, could exploit, but is necessary to preserve utility for rational agents. Uh, okay. And then, and so uh, at this point, uh, that concludes kind of the, the lecture st uh, style portion. Uh, and I'd like to open it up for discussion. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions, please. All right, uh, so I guess if, uh, maybe I'll try asking some questions. So, so I like the general approach here. I guess one obvious question is whether it sort of makes sense to think about knowing the sort of customer's classification goals or whether it makes more sense to try to, you know, like there, there's some, parallel between fair representations and the way we sort of think about synthetic data generation in differential privacy in the sense that you know as you sort of point out here like if you only have one customer if you only have one downstream task like okay like the fair there are sort of no costs the fair representation but there's also sort of like no point to it you could have just solved the classification problem for the um you know, downstream customer. Similarly, in differential privacy, like, you know, you have a choice between trying to answer a single numeric valued query or, you know, solving a, a single machine learning problem or generating synthetic data that can handle a lot of these things. And if there's only one thing you want to do, there's no point. Um, and I guess the, the way we've sort of you know, ended up going in differential privacy is rather than saying, you know, okay, there's some specific downstream customers whose exact goals we know, we sort of try to come up with synthetic data that is useful for some, you know, large, broad class of problems. And so I wonder whether you've got any thoughts about doing the same thing here, where we sort of say, okay, it's not that I've got like customers one, three, and six whose functions I know, but like, you know, I, I want to create, you know, fair representation for customers who'd like to solve some linear classification problem, you know, like maybe predicting one of the features from the others. I don't know which one, for example. Um, if, you, if you sort of 
have thought at all uh, about that problem where we've got, you know, maybe like an infinite class of problems, but in some structured um, some infinite but sort of you know structured class of problems we might want to solve. Yeah, so um, uh, I haven't thought uh, I think too deeply about that particular problem, but I do think I remember seeing a paper um, uh, coming out of Cynthia Dwarf's lab that was uh, trying to do something that um, you might think of as kind of along those lines where uh, they were trying to um, be able to learn, uh, I think, uh, a, a representation for um, solving multiple tasks. And they did like right, uh, uh, kind of make some assumptions about the particular structure of those tasks. I, 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 it escapes me at the moment what exactly they were, but they were of the flavor of like, oh, you know, the infinite class of linear classifiers or such. Um, but, uh, but one thing that does kind of strike me about um, how the cost of demographic secrecy might be connected to uh, a sort of synthetic data approach or a um, customer specific approach um, is that uh, it, it has the, or it, it, it potentially suggests that it might be fruitful for preventing reuse of that synthetic data set outside of the particular um, uh, sort of declared functions or objectives or structure that you you've assumed. Um, so, so that would be my other thought. I don't know, Augustine, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to jump in on with there? Well, mostly to you know uh, say that. Uh, that was kind of the motivation of our paper to prove that this is an interesting problem. Uh, and especially, you know, um, shorter the, the, the gap, you know, because, you know, it, there seems to be this assumption that uh, if you, uh, you want to have fairness and you're not going to be doing the optimization yourself, you, get, you, you just got to jump to this adversarial assumption uh, and it's done very, very routinely. And, we we're like, wait a second, that there seems to be a, that might actually be way too much that we need. And um, and would that matter? Well, yes, that, that paper shows yes. <laughs> so so what you're proposing is exactly sort of you know what we want to motivate. Like obviously, right now we're making this uh, ridiculous assumption that you know exactly what people are gonna do. Uh, immediately they can reuse data among themselves, but you don't you don't even have a person later uh, who would take those data and do something else with it because that would violate all the assumption we have. So, so it's a very, very restricted uh, data reuse. We call it lateral data reuse because it's not, you know exactly what happened next and then it's over. You can basically erase the data no one else is using it. Uh, uh, and we want to do something else. I mean, clearly we have to move forward uh, and it'd be very interesting to know because the problem with, obviously Aaron, you imagine is that, you know, if you, if you allow too much freedom, then you basically go back to pay the big cost. Uh, so what is the, what is in between? You know, what, what is giving people a little bit more freedom uh, and still do not account, you know, do not uh, incur the huge cost of democratic secrecy is, uh, that's where the, the question is, I think. So yeah, yeah, linear and, you know, some class of linear is obviously the next one we want to look at. Um, uh, is it enough <laughs> or is it already, is it already giving people too much uh, chance to exploit? That's going to be an interesting question. Probably depends on the data too. I mean, right now we make a very ridiculous assumption about the model and there will be lots of questions. If, if you don't know that your data have some properties in advance and forget it, but if there are some properties of, you know, independence or correlation or something, you can basically perhaps get some, yeah. I hope that answers a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah I really, I'm, I'm glad you asked this because that's exactly what we wanted to encourage. So. <laughs> Make, makes sense. <laughs> uh, any, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Well, I, I guess, the other thing is, like in your 
random function models, you're sort of a, have this yeah. fixed base rate p across everyone. So you're sort of thinking about functions that already satisfy demographic parity, like on the pop, you know, on the distribution, and so, you know, any deviations from demographic parity are sort of just the result of of sampling error. And how much do the result change? The results change if you um, think about a, a you know, maybe random function model where the target functions don't already satisfy demographic parity on the distribution. So um, I think kind of interestingly um, for the, the particular regime that we consider uh, that you pointed out, right? Like with P fixed and in common across the labeling functions and with the number of uh, customers sort of logarithmic in the number of individuals, that that is the regime where, um, I, I, so I, I can't say for sure, but I, I, I think that that's probably the one where the gap is sort of the biggest um, and the most um, se severe, um, because you could imagine, right? Like if, if you allow the labeling functions to be, um, uh, to differ, um, then it probably then it may make it, uh, or like you you may increase further the cost of fairness, right? Because in, in this in the random functions model, the cost of fairness and expectation would, is actually zero, right, between the groups. And now, if you allow it to, um, if you make it non-zero, then demographic parity needs to, uh, or th sorry, the cost of demographic secrecy would be a cost uh, above that. But the 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 larger the cost of fairness becomes the less space there is beyond the cost of fairness for the cost of demographic secrecy to have, have an effect. So I'm sorry I don't have a more like rigorous technical answer for you, but that's sort of, that would be my hand wavy kind of uh, intuitive answer at the moment. And, yeah, I mean, that... and the result, the gap will, you know, we won't be able to show uh, such a large gap if we don't have this assumption, that's for sure. Uh, but some of the results generalize, you know, uh, like the, the, the bound on uh, some of the costs. Um, I think the main thing is going to be that recovering, because the cost of fairness is just going to increase uh, if you have, I mean, some, it's easy to make a model where the cost of fairness is exactly the cost of democratic secrecy, but you know, you can just say, say the, the, the participants are trying to find the demography, for instance. Uh, so so, so the, the, I, I suspect that uh, the, the, the result on the, on the exponential gap is going to be quite sensitive to an assumption like that. Right. And uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm just yeah, trying to kind of like maybe rephrase and understand this. But like if I'm like looking like the random function model that you have right now, then technically, basically, if I just were to release the original data set, I can actually achieve like near optimal utility in that sense, because basically each function is roughly um, fair in that sense. Which is why, it, so like you were saying, in this case, like the cost is going to be like close to zero, and it just sounds like the square root of v basically is just like a concentration bound, like the sampling error that you get there, which makes it that you deviate by square root of v, so you can't always exactly make it exactly fair, but like up to square root of v, you can make it fair, and so that would be kind of like really kind of like in terms of like cost of fairness, that'd be the best case for the cost of fairness. Is that? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah but this I think this model. I mean, this model is clearly not satisfactory. <laughs> we 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 don't we don't claim at all that this uh, you know it's not an existential result to show that there's a gap and we want to explore. I, I agree with you that that model is a bit don't show it to don't show it to children. I mean, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm not I'm not making any judgment here. I'm just trying to understand the, the result. That's all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I, think I, I, I guess right, maybe like saying it another way, like if I think of the individuals that are sampled as like, you know, the points in my training set, but like really, you know, there's a distribution that's described by the random function. So like I like the separation, like this is a setting, I guess, where, you know, on the distribution, there is no cost of fairness at all. You're thinking about functions yeah. that, uh, already satisfy 
uh, demographic parity. And so rational agents who are going to solve the learning problem perfectly on the distribution, if you release the data set, will be perfectly fair. And yet you're showing there's sort of this finite cost you know, that doesn't go to zero, maybe uh, if you insist on hiding the demographic attributes. Um, yes. Like I think these rates are maybe like obscuring things a little bit, but like on the distribution, this is a setting where like there's no cost to fairness because by construction, the functions are fair. And yet you're sort of showing that the cost of secrecy is, is you know, something. And, and also, it's nice to see that you, you know, when the cost of fairness is so small, you can, you can actually almost achieve it. Uh, when the cost of fairness is much larger, then okay, you can achieve it. Uh, but in a way, you lost a lot. So that's the situation. The only merit of that model is that you know, for people who really believe uh, that uh, fairness should be cheap, well, that's that's an example where fairness is really cheap. And yes, you can do it for multiple people, and that are reused without incurring uh, more cost. As long as you're not insisting on demographic secrecy, then you lose everything. Yeah. All right, uh, it is past the hour, it's like one six right now, so we should probably just uh, call it a day at this point. Uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk, it was like, super interesting. Uh, yeah, and this is actually, this was the last talk of the semester, so we'll resume at some point, uh, like one day. <laughs> so now is the final exam. <laughs> yeah, now the final exam. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your invitation, and you know, and, and please contact us with any you know follow-ups. Uh, we 